Hephaestus, the Greek god of fire and metallurgy, had two golden robots. And these robots had their inherent strength, their voice, and the ability to think. Now, in order to have the ability to think, one has to have a brain or some artifact that can act intelligently. We have always dreamt of building such an artifact. But the first time that someone actually did that, or at least gave us a model to do that, was in 1943. This was the model given by Walter McCullough and Pitts. And that tried to mimic the human brain to build a model of a neuron, which is a unit in our brains, and that goes on and off based on the signals it gets from its surroundings. Now, if before we go into whether a computer can think, we have to ask, what does it mean to think? And in 1950, Alan Turing gave us this definition, this test, if you will, of a Turing test, which is to distinguish between a computer and a human being. So essentially, you have the computer or the human being sitting in a room outside, you ask some questions, somehow the answers come back, and if you can tell whether this is a computer or a human being, then basically the computer has failed the Turing test. Okay. So that was the test. And in 1958, Marvin Minsky and Edmonds built what is known as a neural network. Remember the model? They built the first system based on it. And it had 30 or 40 neurons, and about 3,000 vacuum tubes were involved in building it. Now, this is one neuron. So there were 3,000 of this in a, in a room. But in 1957 and 58, people said, People eminent, like Herb Simon, said that, well, in the near visible future, a computer will pass the Turing test. Forty years later, I was a graduate student, full of energy, full of enthusiasm, and full of hair. <laughs> and I had a dream, like many others, to make computers think, to make them write, to make them learn. Now, fast forward a few more years. As a professor at Penn State University, I had half my hair still. We bent on starting a project that would look at computers and see if these computers can be taught how to detect sentiment in natural language. Now, natural language is very hard for computers because Natural language is based on the context. The meaning of words is based on the context it appears in. And what we did is, we looked at a web forum, the Cancer Network Forum by the American Cancer Society, and we looked at the discourse between people. So we said, can a computer understand whether a person is sad or happy or if the mood is changing? And what we did is we handcrafted the rules. We said, okay, this, this cue means that this, is, this person is sad. So we gave the computer certain cues to go by, and then it built a model to figure out that this person is sad or this person is happy. And in general, what we found on that forum is that most people, most people's sentiment actually get better over time. So you see the slope is like this. On the x-axis, that's the initial sentiment. On the left is sad. On the right is happy. And you see the sentiment change. Uh, obviously, the person who was more sad has more of a chance of being happier. Okay. But the good thing about that was that the computer could do this with about 85, 80 to 85% accuracy. Now, that's, human beings can do it much better, but this was a good start. Now, we use the same thing, the same tool, to detect who a leader is in that forum. Now, it turns out that forum leaders are servant leaders. That is, they are the people who help people who are coming in and posting. And between their first post and the second post in the same thread, most of these leaders post something useful, like emotional support, most of the time, and sometimes even informational support. 
and they help people. So just using this, we could automatically detect who is a leader and who is not. And that was useful to the social worker running the forum. Because what happens is sometimes these leaders just vanish and then they have to approach someone else to keep the forum going. Fast forward a few more years, well, maybe I had lost more hair, and the things were getting desperate. So I said, I talked to my student, I said, look, you know, we need to do something. Can we teach a computer to write? Now, before I lose all my hair. So that was the challenge. So what we did is we said, well, what can we write? Well, we should write something that nobody is writing. I mean, I don't want to put people out of jobs. So what we did is we said, well, let's take Wikipedia. Wikipedia has a list of articles that they had wanted to be written for several years. And nobody was writing them. So what we did is we built this system that goes in and authors articles. It goes onto the web, reads articles about the topic, finds uh, important information, and then summarizes it. So as you can see, this is an article that was automatically written by our bot. This is a play, Chitra, by Rabindranath Thakur. And it's not perfect, but it contains substantial information. And now, this is the article a few days ago. If some of you had read the synopsis, you will see that the synopsis has been rewritten by human editors, but it contains uh, some of the in, you know, relevant information, more or less, as was identified by the computer. Now, there has been a revolution in computing in the last five years. There's something called deep learning, a technology that, well, it's not that new. Remember that neural networks? So neural networks had certain problems. The same neural network, the network model that was proposed in 1940s and 50s, there was a limitation which got worked out. I don't have time to go into the details. But after the neural network's limitation got worked out, these neural networks can now learn on its own. So Google created a neural network that goes through hundreds of thousands of pictures of dogs and cats and eventually figured out what is a dog and what is a cat on its own. No human supervision. Like in the sentiment analysis, we said these are the keywords that was not given to them. So it's not like rules are given to this computer. It learned on its own. Now, how is this possible? Well, essentially, these neural networks are mimicking the human brain. There are layers and layers of neurons, and that's why it is called deep learning. And these neurons are figuring out what are the interesting features. So at the base level, the neurons are learning, let's say, this is a line. At the second level, it's learning, okay, this is a leg in a dog. And at the next level, it's learning, okay, this is the back part of a dog. And then it's learning that it's a dog, and then it's, the dog is chasing the cat, and then the dog is chasing the cat in the park, and so on and so forth. So if you have patiently listened to me, you're thinking, great, that's all we needed. You know, a computer that can identify a dog from a cat. Hallelujah. <laughs> but no, a computer that can learn on its own the difference between a dog and a cat could also learn on its own, perhaps, whether a self-driving car is looking at a real person trying to cross, and it can look at a cancer image and see if there is a tissue that's abnormal or is it normal. The application of deep learning has resulted in computers performing better than human beings with respect to some tasks. And these are not mundane tasks like crunching out a big multiplication, but these are tasks like identifying objects in an image. So the computers have won several challenges. There's a website called Kaggle on which they run challenges. And computer deep learning based methods have won challenges for discovering drugs. They have won challenges on segmenting the brain, and of course, the cat versus dog challenge, identifying cats and dogs. So that is the power of deep learning. Now this is what has made it possible. Okay. In recent years, 
Computing has become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and data has grown. So the confluence of cheap computing and big data means that we can now build these neurons, these neural networks, that are larger and larger and larger. Google's neural networks had 20,000 computers, computing cores, and you can see a picture there. And that did the trick. But you need to remember that the human brain, each of us, have about 100 billion neurons, over maybe 100 trillion connections, and we are talking about computers with 30 layers and maybe 20,000 nodes. But even using the simple version of the human brain, we could achieve this much. That is what the revolution is today. So in our lab, what we did is we went in and we used this technology to decide whether we could work on some other problems than identifying cats versus dogs. I mean, I know that's important. But so what we did is we said is, can you come up with citations. You know, those documents that you write, citations are things that give credit where it is due. These are the references. And if you don't get your citations right, or if you don't cite, there are these plagiarism police which will come and catch you. Some of them are around here. Okay. So our tool is a recommendation system. Just like Amazon and Netflix were mentioned, I'm sure you go into Amazon, Netflix, eBay, YouTube. The system recommends some things that you may or may not like. It recommended that I, if, when I bought something for my wife, the next day it recommended a pink dress for me, and I said, no thanks. <laughs> but that's getting better with deep learning. So what we tried to do is to find and suggest articles that perhaps you should be reading. You come in and you give us some keywords, or better still, if you have a half-written article, you give it to us, and then the computer goes in and finds out where, what citations are necessary, and comes in and gives you a suggestion. Now that's still a suggestion. You need to go in and look at it and select and so on and so forth. So it's not an automatic authoring tool, but that at least gives you a set of things that you should go and read, and perhaps you didn't know about it. So that's what deep learning can enable. Now we have talked about all of that, but we have to also address the other question. So if this is what computers can do, they can think, they can learn, they can write, so what am I going to do? Am I going to be out of a job? Right? And the answer, perhaps, I don't know. Nobody does. But the answer, perhaps, is that computers will take away jobs that what we call as low-level skills. So those are the jobs that perhaps will go first. And then who knows? Now you see here, what happens is every technology is, when it comes out, is disruptive. It changes the status quo. And computers are going to do the same. Our desire to automate, our desire to create, our desire to build things means that we have gone down the path of automation such that it's possibly not desirable to stop now or it's the lure is too much for us to stop. What we need to do is we need to get prepared. Now you, perhaps, would not want a computer to be your personal counselor or for a computer to give you a massage <laughs> or for that computer to be a nurse. I mean, would you like to see a soccer game played by robots? No. Would you, would you like a computer be your lawyer or your politician? I mean, think about it. If, if all the lawyers are computers, who are we going to joke about? <laughs> and if all the, all the politicians are computers, then it's really nobody interesting to hate. So the, my point is to the young people out here is that we don't have all the answers, but you as social scientists, as artists, as lawyers, as politicians, even though the ones we hate, and as general people, citizens of society, we need to make sure that we take care of people who are 
unfortunate enough to lose their jobs to a computer. At least the government should be encouraged to provide retraining opportunities for people who lose their jobs when there is automation. That is the future that is coming. Are you ready?